The first question most non-boaters ask when they get chatting to a liverboard is, isn't it cold? And the answer is probably no, but preparation is the key to enjoying the winter or any other extreme conditions on a boat. A quick reality check tells you that you're living in a steel box or perhaps wood, iron or GRP depending on your vessel floating on cold water and you're never going to have the same insulation between you and the elements that a modern has. Having said that, you have a much smaller space to keep warm or cool and you're much more aware of what's going on around you, how the weather is changing and the seasons advancing. Now I've had the sun streaming through the windows and of course on the towpath side of the boat when there's a frost on the grass the temperature outside um, may just have risen above freezing but inside we can be a fraction below 26 degrees thanks to a, a multi-fuel stove and the hatch open to shed some of that extra heat. We've been just as cosy through a December that saw temperatures fall to at least minus 8 degrees as we have been in spring and summer. To be honest, it's more difficult to keep the boat cool in the summer than warm in the winter. The starting point is understanding how your boat functions as an environment. I should talk about steel boats because uh, most of them are the same, um, most of them are the same, and the same applies to the materials to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, a steel boat's easily affected by external temperatures and changes its temperature very swiftly in response to both air and water temperature, temperature changes. Even on a cold day, uh, a strong sun is enough to heat the external steel on a boat to a point where it's difficult to keep your hand on it and in the height of summer you could easily fry an egg on a boat roof. In winter you can have several inches of snow on the steel and the extreme, the extreme temperatures we've seen in the past uh, mean the frozen steel can stick your hands to the metal literally. In most narrow boats the only thing protecting the occupants of the boat is the layer of insulation, perhaps a couple of inches thick, between the steel and the wood lining of the boat. As a result, any heat in the boat is drawn towards the cold steel and dissipates into the outside atmosphere. When you supply heat inside the boat, it must be enough to keep up with the loss through the sides. And that's true whether you're heating with a stove burning coal or wood or diesel or gas central heating. However, this simple picture is complicated by three other factors. Your boat is sitting with a, around the bottom two feet of it in water. There are gaps and holes in the steel structure for doors and vents that will allow hot air to escape or cold air to enter. And of course, the windows or portholes can't be insulated so they will be losing much more heat than the insulated steel. Now, there's not much you can do about the water factor. Most boats have little or no insulation on the base of the boat, and that lowest two feet will always be the coolest part of the vessel, as water changes temperature much more slowly than air. This is a great advantage in the summer, as it gives you cool spots to keep things, like beer. However, be aware that when the canal freezes over that your water pump and associated plumbing is probably on or near the base plate of the vessel and may need a bit of extra protection. Drafts from doors and other fittings can be fixed using ordinary domestic draft excluders but you can't block the vents specified by the boat safety certificate rules. If you want to stay safe from carbon monoxide or leaking gas fumes, that is. So that's one reason why liverboard boaters often have pram hoods at the stern and cratch covers at the bow. They ameliorate the gale force winds whipping along the cut and straight through those regulation vents. Heat loss through windows can be dealt with in a number of ways. It's uh, one reason why some opt for portholes rather than windows. They're smaller, so less heat loss, and can always be bunged up with a cushion to, to keep out the cold. In summer, they don't allow so much heat into the boat, of course, and keep it cooler. 
The downside is that you live in the dark, even on the sunniest days. Most modern boats have double glazed windows, which helps, but not as much as you might think. Our former hire boat, our home for some years, um, has masses of large windows and over the years we've developed a sort of three layer system that helps in both winter and summer. In addition to the windows we've double thickness thermal lined curtains that draw across the uh, blinds that sit underneath them. Um, there's choice between uh, of course solid fuel so stoves and central heating and there's a number of factors to consider. Most central heating runs on diesel or gas. Gas has trebled in price in the years we've been on living on board from around 1250 for 13 kilo bottle to well over 35 pounds now. Diesel's gone from around 30p a litre to well over 70p at the very cheapest prices. Coal, of course, now imported from all over the world, despite the fact we're sitting on several thousand years worth of reserves, has risen from around five pounds for a 25 kilo to nine, eight, nine, ten pounds or more. We've used all three of them. Our boat came with gas central heating and we swiftly, swiftly found it would go through uh, two cylinders of gas a week in the coldest weather, 25 pounds a week in those much cheaper days and 70 pounds a week now. We switched to oil central heating and we still have that on, in place and found it worked out cheaper, about 20 pounds a week I suppose in the early days, about 40 pounds a week now. Uh, that's when the temperatures fall to the uh, deep minuses outside. And when we installed a um, 7 kilowatt solid fuel stove and invested in an eco fan to push the heat the length of the boat, it at about uh, just over two bags of smokeless fuel a week, say 20 pounds a week, about half the cost of diesel. Um, of course, if you burn wood and invest in the work to collect it and saw it up and Burn it, a solid fuel store, a stove has an almost zero cost, but uh, it's more difficult to keep it in overnight. Our current diesel stove, stove burns less than a litre an hour and costs in the region of £28 a week, but that includes hot water. If these prices seem excessive, bear in mind that I'm only talking about the, the coldest winter weeks, the sort of weeks when our government pays out extra fuel allowances to pensioners. The truth is that you use, you use less in spring and autumn and by May you're probably not using any at all so the costs over the year are much more reasonable. The non-financial price you pay with solid fuel as my wife will tell you is that uh, it creates much more dust through the boat. Um, it's carried by the eco fan to the furthest nooks and crannies. Having said that I'd bet that 9 out of 10 liverboards eventually settle for solid fuel heating. See, once you've had a solid fuel stove, uh, you're then in the business of managing heat. You want it flat out when the temperatures drop, uh, drop. You want it just glowing gently when the sun comes out. And it should never go out unexpectedly. There are people who allow their fire to go out overnight and all I can say is they're hardier than I am. I want to wake up to a warm boat uh, this is where you need to keep a, a close eye on the world around you. Look at the forecasts for sudden temperature drops and possibly invest on, a, in a, and possibly invest on an inside-outside thermometer so that uh, you can see how cold it's getting in your mooring spot. Then you have to get to know your stove using the various vents and adjusters, work out how to open or close them to keep the fire going at a particular temperature. It's more of an art than a science, I admit, and a strong wind across the chimney will do more to raise the temperature than anything else. But experience will transform you, transform you uh, into an expert fire manager and your boat will stay at your chosen temperature, whatever the weather. In fact, the winter will become a doddle until the point where you become locked in the ice. If you're a marina moorer or you have a mooring with some facilities, there's usually less of a problem with a big freeze. And of course they're very few and far between, but if you're a traveller, ensure you keep an eye on the forecast so you're reasonably close to 
water and waste disposal when the freeze arrives. The problem then is not keeping warm, but dealing with water, water supplies and disposing of elsons and rubbish. If you're really lucky and you can thaw out the water point, a daisy chain of hose pipes may help reach most of the boats tied alongside you. If not, you'll need to carry containers of water. We were lucky enough to be frozen in at Great Haywood a few years ago, where Anglo-Welsh kept their Elson Point open and the taps were usually thawable. Despite that, it meant several weeks of twice daily trips with a 25 litre container for water over a steep and very slippery bridge. I don't say it isn't hard work in winter, just that you don't get cold. Well, now we're at um, a period where the sun is out and I'm looking out of the window at uh, a buzzard perched just a few feet from the boat in a bush on the towpath at Norbury Junction. Those few weeks of deepest winter are a distant adventure. We were never seriously at risk of even a shiver and even on the coldest days, we'd often opt to open the windows of the stern hatch to lose a bit of heat. Isn't it cold in winter? Never. Never if you plan ahead and if you know what you're doing. 